Hi, everyone. Hi. Welcome to Liz Rule Talk. Good to see you. It's、uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. So happy Tuesday, happy Wednesday. All right. So for me, it's the start of the week. For some of you, it's middle of the week. I hope you are.、Um, Um, someone said, "Lay it 迟到了 Sorry, I'm a couple of minutes late. We have quite a number of.、Um, I have prepared a couple of videos,、um, so we have quite quite a number of visual aids, shall we say? So I was uploading them. All right, so we're going to tackle、uh, a major subject, right? And、uh, so we we know we'll talk about the possibility of a world war." World War Three. Oh, it's a mouthful to say. Sorry. We know that if、uh, a World War Three breaks out, Taiwan will be the center stage, and the war will be between China and the United States. Chairman Mao actually said this 68 years ago, and he said World War Three should be fought in China. He wanted it to be fought in China. So whether or not such a a major Uh, war will happen depends on, in my opinion, two major factors. The first is the tension between China and the United States, and the second is Xi Jinping's state of mind or his decision making, because the United States、um, are, are not likely to start the war, right? But the tension between China and the United States、uh, plays a big part in 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 that. In that world event, so the so the these are the two major factors.、Um, it's a big topic to cover in one live stream, so I I'll divide it into two parts. Today we'll address part one, which is um, um, the latest China U.S. tension. We'll we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about CCP leaders' vision of a world war World War Three. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we'll address the second part, which I know many of you are interested in: Xi Jinping's decision making and state of mind、um, this Thursday. So this Thursday, that's two days from my Thursday. So for some of you, it may be Friday. In basically, in two days, we'll address part two. Okay, so so today we'll focus on the latest、um, U.S.-China relations or tensions. So you may be aware the latest development is this:、um, on June third, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Navy's guided missile destroyer USS Zhongzhongshan,、um, um, I think, Zhong no Zhongyun in Chinese is Zhongyun Hao, and then this spelling it, it's named the the ship is named after、um, the first Asian American.、Uh, General who fought in World War Two. Let me play a video. I actually have that uploaded. So here's the video that actually showed the the、uh, incident. So the USS Zhongyun Hao Zhongyun was on a joint crossing with the Canadian destroyer USS Montreal in the Taiwan Strait when a Chinese PLA warship suddenly changed course and crossed over,、um, and then the two vessels. Were less than 150 yards apart, and the American ship had to slow down to avoid a co collision. So, this is the second similar incident in A days. On May 26, an American Air Force reconnaissance plane was intercepted by a Chinese fighter jet in the South China Sea. The Chinese jet cut directly in front of the American plane. Forcing it to fly through the tail stream of the Chinese jet. So two such incidents within、um, within eight days、uh, is un very unusual. So what is the CCP trying to accomplish? I don't think the CCP is creating incidents to start a war, but these events are very similar to the spy balloon incident that we saw in February. Which drastically deteriorated U.S.-China relations.、Um, remember the spy balloon、um, happened in February. Spy balloons have been flying around the world for a while before becoming a major incident. The U.S. government knew about it but didn't say much until the balloon was discovered by the media. 
um, Sino-U.S. relations deteriorated quickly from that point on. Similarly, the PLA's aggressive conduct against U.S. military and its allies isn't new and had been ongoing. We didn't hear much about it because the Biden administration hasn't been saying much until recently. On February 17th, 2020, a U.S. Maritime patrol aircraft was flying over international waters approximately 380 miles west of Guam and was laser attacked by a Chinese destroyer. On February 19, 2022, two Chinese naval vessels traveled to Australia's northern waters and were followed by an Australian maritime control aircraft. Again, the CCP's vessels shone laser beam at the Australian aircraft. The PLA's conduct was politely addressed as unprofessional by the Australian Department of Defense. As early as May 2018, the U.S. military accused personnel at a Chinese military base in Djibouti, in Djibouti, Africa, of shining laser beams at a U.S. transport plane, causing eye injuries to two U.S. pilots. Beijing denied it, but the U.S. military uh, announced that similar incidents had occurred at least four times before that. So that was in 2018, um, five years ago. At the recent Shangri-La security dialogue in Singapore, Chinese defense minister Li Shangfu blamed the United States for the recent incidents. I think I have a picture of him. Not This is not the guy. Here we go. He said the best way to avoid these situations is for all countries to keep their military aircraft and warships out of the other countries, out of other countries' territorial waters and airspace. And he called on the Americans to quote, control your own warships and control your own aircraft. After his speech, he was, he was asked um, a question about, about the incidents, and he replied by asking a rhetorical question, and he said, why did all these incidents happen near China's airspace and territorial waters and not in the vicinity of other countries' airspace and territorial waters? Um, so from from the service, his answer fooled some some people, right? Unless you really know what has been happening um, in in the international waters between the PLA and then the militaries of other of other nations, his question seemed to be kind of valid. Um, He's basically saying that the U.S. and allied aircraft and warships should not be in the vicinity of China's coastline and that the PLA aircraft and warships had never entered the airspace and territorial waters of other countries. But this is a blatant lie. For at least in the past three years, Chinese warships have circled Japan's main island several times and PLA aircraft carrier Um, or carriers, have rehearsed in the waters of Japan at least three times. Japan's self-defense forces have sent warships to follow and monitor PLA's activities, sometimes at very close range. Pictures made public by CCP's own media had shown um, the Japanese ships, uh, Japanese frigate Izumu, right next to the CCP's um, Liaoning carrier and its frigid. And I actually have a picture here. Oh, here. So this is a picture published by the CCP. Um, This was dated December 30th, 2021. And someone added the Chinese names just to identify which, which ship is which. So the bottom ship is the Liaoning carrier. The top right is the Japanese uh, frigate Izumo, Izumo, and the one, the tiny ship on the left is the Chinese, uh, the Liaoning carrier, carrier's frigate called uh, Rizhao. Yeah. So, so these are the three ships in this picture released by the CCP's media. Um, and on the next day, so this is on the following day, December 31st, 
uh, this also this is another picture released by by China's state media. The circle it actually marked the circle. The the ship in the circle is a Japanese um, ship, and then the one on the on the right is the Liaoning carrier, and they're very close. So Japanese warships. Um, uh, oh, and also Japanese warplanes plan followed the CCP's um, fighter jets and took clear pictures of the CCP's aircraft carrier. Um, but unlike the, the CCP's uh, warplanes and warships, uh, Japanese planes and, and ships did not make any unprofessional um, interceptions. And in late 2022, and also in April this year, a Chinese carrier came close to the American island of Guam twice, and the U.S. military was well aware of it, but did not make unprofessional um, interceptions either. And in April, the Chinese ship Shandong made its first training voyage and approached the Philippines. And on June 1st, 2021, 16 Chinese transport planes entered the Malaysian flight information area and the Malaysian Air Force sent fighter jets to intercept the planes. Uh, but all of these were, uh, were without incidents. And PLA aircraft have also repeatedly entered the air defense identification zone of South Korea and Japan, South Korean and Japanese warplanes have intercepted, but no one, not the Americans, South Koreans, Japanese, Malaysians, and maybe others, Australians, made any unprofessional moves. So in my live stream program on June 3rd, that's three days ago, I discussed the mistake that Americans or many Westerners make or made when dealing with the CCP. Um, the mistake is that civilized people, um, they, they treat, they oftentimes treat a ruffian like a gentleman. As a result, they get bullied and abused. Well, the United States have followed, um, have allowed uh, the United States and its allies have allowed the CCP's eg egregious behavior for too long. And these two events, recent, uh, these, these recent two events that took place within eight days are just like the spy balloon incident. Um, they will send the sano us relations in a downward trend faster than ever. During his trip to India and France, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin told reporters that the PLA Navy's behavior was extremely dangerous. He asked the Chinese leaders to control the PLA's behavior because, he said, there could be accidents that cause things to get out of control. John Kirby, director of um, Director of Strategic Communications for the White House National Security Council, also said on this Monday that it won't take long for someone to get hurt if incidents like this um, keep happening. So I think the uncontrollability of such aggressive behavior has increased the risk of war significantly. Beijing may not want to start a war, but the PLA's aggressive behavior is part of is part of its um, psychological warfare. It may not be part of its physical war by design, but it's part of its psychological warfare to achieve two goals. One is to gain more bargaining chip with the United States in their um, negotiation, shall we say, in their negotia negotiation trying to return to a dialogue. Um, because the, the CCP knows that the Biden administration is trying to engage um, Beijing in a dialogue and that Beijing is playing hard to get. So this will give Beijing more bargaining chip um, in order before reaching a consensus to return to a dialogue, dialogue table or a table for, for open dialogue. And the second goal is to intimidate the U.S. military to back off um, 
But the psychological warfare is based on CCP's a unique CCP war mentality, and I, and I must explain that.、Um, about six a month ago, a Chinese sociologist by the name of Li Yi, who was the director of the Institute of Taiwan Studies at Fuzhou University, this guy attended a discussion in the U.S. He made the speech in the U.S. He claimed that the Chinese are willing to sacrifice 140 million people. To take over Taiwan, so let me quickly play the clip、um, of his speech. Okay, hold on, hold on. Let me let me start from the very beginning. He talked rather quickly. So, if China died in Taiwan, it cost one million lives. This is a small piece of history in human history. I want to kill one million Taiwanese. There should be some people who have already made the preparation for death and the preparation for seven thousand. Or if they have a little education, these young people will agree. To agree to kill Taiwan, Taiwan. 中国死上一次或者七千万。战争大陆讲得很清楚，叫不惜牺牲西安以东五百个城市。All right, um, okay, you get that, right? It's quite outrageous, isn't it? And he made this. He said this while in the United States. Um, this guy actually, um. This this guy actually has a PhD from、uh, from an American university. I don't know which one.、Uh, he the, the same the same guy said in 2021 that if Taiwan's 23 million people fight to the end and don't surrender, it would be a piece of cake for for the mainland to immigrate 46 million people to Taiwan、uh, if all Taiwanese had died. So、uh, it's quite outrageous. From 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 our oh, by the way, how he how he came up with the number 140 million? He claimed that、uh, he said his number is based on the American Civil War. He said the United States had a population of 30 million during the American Civil War, and three million Americans died, and that's 10 percent of the total population. So he argued that if If ten percent of Americans died in a war that unified the country, then the Chinese would have no problem of shedding ten percent of its population to take over Taiwan. But his numbers were wrong. The total casualties during the American Civil War、um, were between, I think, five hundred thousand to six hundred sixty thousand, and and the, the the death was mostly. Um, soldiers who fought in the war, so he got his numbers wrong. But anyways, what I want to point out is his view is not. I mean, of course, his view got ordinary Chinese citizens, you know, upset because they're saying, "Well, you go first, you know, you and your family be <laughs> be part of the hundred forty million if you believe in it."、Um, but what I want to point out, his view is not totally unpopular in China. There are quite a Uh, there are quite a number of million Chinese who hold his view. They may—they're not the majority, but they could be、um, influential. And the idea came from Mao Zedong. So now I want to talk about Mao Zedong's vision of World War Three. When Mao Zedong visited Soviet Union in 1949,、uh, where are my slides? Here, here we go. He told.、Uh, this is、uh, Khrushchev. Sorry, this is Khrushchev, not not Stalin. It's okay.、Um, he, he told Stalin, "We are prepared to have three, three hundred million Chinese die for the victory of the global revolution." Chinese population at that time was 450 million, so Mao was prepared to sacrifice two thirds of the country's people to establish a community of common destiny. In 1955,、um, when meeting with Soviet representatives, Mao said, "A world war isn't a terrible thing." He said the result of World War One was that a socialist state was born. The result of World War II was that a socialist camp or bloc was developed. If World War III breaks out, 
will revolutionize the whole world. And he then said, we should fight World War III early and on a large scale. It should be a nuclear war and it should be fought in China. In the same year, um, he told Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, if World War III breaks out, I suggest that the Soviet Union pretends to sit on the sideline while I lead the Chinese people to draw the Americans into, chi into China. We'll fight a conventional war and let the war expand and snowball. We'll pretend to be defeated to draw American troops further into interior China, into the sea of the people. This will force the United States to send its main forces to the battlefield in China. At that point, I'd ask the Soviet Union to drop atomic bombs on China to wipe out the main American forces in one swoop. This will probably kill 400 million Chinese, but it's worth the sacrifice of two thirds of China's population in exchange for a world of common, in exchange for a world of common destiny. Khrushchev was shocked. He rejected Mao's proposal, saying that the sacrifice to the Chinese people would be too great. Mao said, after 400 million die, we still have 200 million people. Um, at the time, China's population was 600 million. Um, he said, it wouldn't take many years for China to have 600 million people again. In 1957, Mao Zedong visited Soviet Union for the second time. At the International Communist Conference in Moscow, Mao got into an argument with Khrushchev, and Mao said, atomic bombs are not, are not a big deal. In my view, it's also a paper tiger. The fundamental factor behind determining victory in war is man, not one or two new weapons. Um, okay, let me reread that. He said, the fundamental factors the, the fundamental factor determining victory in war is men, not one or two new weapons. The atomic bomb also depends on men to maneuver. Um, and then he said, in a nuclear war, a lot of people will surely die. We may lose 300 million people, but does it matter? Even so, we can still win the war in the end. He said, big deal. We'll have a nuclear war. What's the big deal about a nuclear war? There are 2.6 billion people in the world. If half, if a half is dead, there's still a half left. Of the 600 million people in China, if a half is dead, we, we still have 300 million. Why should I be afraid of anyone? Once Mao Zedong uttered those words, the entire room was silent. The communist leaders from the other communist countries couldn't understand why Chairman Mao thought the death of 300 million of his people was nothing. So Khrushchev believed Mao Zedong was a war maniac and a madman. He refused Mao Zedong's plan. It was a big blow to Mao's dream of creating a community of common destiny. And this was the beginning of this Sino-Soviet split. Um, how do we know this piece of history? Well, on January 13th, 2011, the People's Daily's online history channel published a post titled Mao Zedong's Speeches on Nuclear War. The content came from a lecture titled Anecdotes About Mao Zedong's Visits to the Soviet Union. And it was a lecture given by a Chinese historian by the name of Shen Zhihua. Um, Shen was later attacked by uh, other some other Chinese scholars or people for smearing Chairman Mao's image, but those who attack him did not provide any evidence to to say otherwise to prove that he was wrong. Um, I want to point out that Mao's ideas still have a following today. They're not the majority, but they may be. They, they, they may be, I mean, the people who follow him may not, are definitely not the majority, but they may be influential ones. Xi Jinping appears to be a devoted disciple of Mao, right? Um, so from Mao to Deng and now to Xi Jinping, Chinese communist leaders believe that their willingness to sacrifice human life 
makes them more competitive on the battlefield. They think the universal value of cherishing human life is a weakness on battlefield. Um, so this is the reason why you see you see these aggressive behavior from the PLA. Um, it's behind that. It's this kind of a war mentality, and it's deeply rooted within the communist system. So, like I said in my June third program, intelligence and capability capabilities become irrelevant when you are dealing with a rogue regime, right? When you're dealing with a ruffian who plays dirty, so the West must be clear on this. Now, the the clash between the U.S. and the Chinese warships and aircraft came as two senior U.S. diplomats were in Beijing for a face-to-face -face meeting. It's called the mid-level meeting meetings. So, Assistant Secretary of State in charge of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Daniel. Crittenbrink. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Sorry, I'm trying to show. Here's here's um, Chairman Mao and Khrushchev. Um, the two didn't see eye to eye. And uh, so here's this this gentleman, the U.S. Um, Assistant Secretary of State in charge of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, and Senior Director of China Taiwan. Uh, Director for China and Taiwan at the White House National Security Council, Sarah Barron. The two were in China for our meetings, and judging from the short statements released from both sides, the meeting didn't make any breakthroughs. The U.S. ambassador to China, Nicholas Burns,、uh, also participated in the meetings, and he said in an interview with the media. That Beijing has a great interest in economic cooperation, and that two countries are considering resuming dialogues. I think over economic、um, affairs. So this confirms my analysis on June third that the, the 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 CCP's current strategy, the current policy strategy. To deal with Sino-U.S. relations is playing tough politically and militarily, but、uh, being cooperative, cooperative or somewhat cooperative、um, over economic affairs. And last month, CIA Director William Burns also secretly—I shouldn't say also secretly—visited China. So I think either Joe Biden or Xi Jinping,、uh, neither. Sorry, neither Joe Biden nor Xi Jinping wants to start World War III, but the relations of the two countries are on a downward trajectory so fast that neither of them can stop the momentum.、Um, just like neither one wanted the spy balloon to become an incident, but couldn't prevent it.、Um, So we've discussed part one of this series. The, the 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 most important question is: So will we see a war breakout soon?、Um, there's part two to that. That is Xi Jinping's state of mind and his decision making. And for that question,、um, I have been reading and following. Some of the top China analysts that I trust, there seems to be two schools of view among among them. One school believes that a war is imminent and unavoidable, and they even give a a, a timeline. And the other school believes that the chance of a physical war is very small. Both schools have very good reasonings, and、uh, it will be.、Uh, I'll present them on Thursday with my analysis.、Um, To talk about that, so that ends my presentation today. Let me see if people have any questions for me. All right. If you have questions for me, you can、um, put my name in the front so I know it's addressed to me. Okay, so from Sumiland, I'd, I'd better get my chores done. Oh, I hope you did. <laughs> okay. 
Um, from Martin Eleven, good morning. I see. I saw NATO are planning to open a liaison office in Tokyo, but France's president is trying to block it in return for economic favors from Beijing. Typical France, unfortunately. Yes, yeah. Um, but I, I, I doubt if he will be able to stop it. Let me see questions for me. From Max Schroeder, hey, Lei, why are so many princelings left-wing populists? For example, Xi and Bo in Chongqing, but those who aren't princelings, they are pragmatic leaders like Hu Jintao, Jian. Um, mm, I think left and right for CCP leaders Aren't aren't the best aren't the best adjectives to describe? Unlike American politicians, you could say you know the one on the left and on the right, the conservative and the, the progressive. I think I think there isn't there isn't a CCP leader who isn't a leftist who isn't on the left. I mean the. Right, they're all hardcore communists. You, like Jiang Zemin is definitely Jiang Zemin rose to power because of his support to the, you know, to Deng Xiaoping's bloody crackdown on the students. He was, you know, he he was he he got he got the job of um, party secretary because of his hardcore, um, because of his hardcore leftist policies in Shanghai. Um, students' protests broke out all across China in 1989, but Shanghai was one of the cities that saw the the the, the most severe crackdown on the students' movement, and because of Jiang Zemin. So they're all leftists. They're all hardcore communists. I mean, Hu Jintao did not appear that way because he was weak. He just he was forever he was in um, in Jiang Zemin's shadow. Uh, we never knew what he really thought so th that made him seemed a little harmless because of his weak because he was weak but i wouldn't say they're left or so i'm not so sure if your question is really valid that, that you say well these leaders are more pragmatic and then princelings are more um hardcore maoists everything they do I would say everything they do is to save the party and then to protect their own interests. And their interest, whether it's political power or money, um, it's all for themselves. Unfortunately, Xi Jinping is not very interested in money. Uh, so he is willing to drag China through a, a period of poverty because the man does not does not care about money. I always said if he liked money a little bit, maybe things could be a little easier. But I don't think he he really likes money. He does not like capitalism. He does not like money. So poverty is not a problem for him. But the other leaders are hardcore communists and someone who loves money. So who is more dangerous? I think those hardcore communists uh, under the cover of a reformist are more deadly. They are more dangerous. Someone, I saw this article written by some um, think tank. Uh, I don't remember which one, but they have already, some American think tank have already come up with the, the conclusion that Xi Jinping is actually doing a great thing uh, in, 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 in our interest because he is, he, he is not hiding anymore. He is telling the whole world, uh, look at me. This is what a communist, communist leader, this is what a communist regime is capable of doing and, wa and wants to do. So he's reminding the whole world, particularly the, the Western allies, the, the true face of, of um, a communist regime. So from that perspective, I mean, he's... he's 
you know, destroying, uh, he's destroying Chinese economy. He's, he, he's destroying his own regime from within. So from that perspective, it's good. It's good, but it's just very unfortunate to, um, to the Chinese people who are being dragged through this dreadful process. Um, but from the from the Americans' perspective, it's it's not what what he's doing is not a bad thing, right? Sorry for the long answer. Hopefully, I I addressed that question. Um, let me see. Okay, from Max Schroeder, Guo Wenqi Guo Wenqi said that CCP leaders have a lot of women. Do you think that she has? Got many mistresses. Thanks for the answer. I I have not read a lot of things on that question, and um, and I know there are people who like to believe that there 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 are people who have been spreading things about that. But you know, there are a lot of Chinese rumors. Sometimes it's hard to know which one is real, which one is not real. Um. I, I can give you two answers. One is I don't know enough to say anything, or I have not read enough to to say anything. But on the other hand, my gut feeling is he is definitely not uh, as interested in in women as some of the other notorious Chinese, uh, the the womanizer Ch Chinese leaders. Yeah, I I would say there's a difference. That's my gut feeling, but I don't know. All right, um, some would say Mao was funny. <laughs> I when I read when I when I read that whole passages about what he said to the Russian leader, I was like, "That's amazing." I mean, not not from a good perspective. I'm saying people need to know what's in the mind of a communist leader, um, and and I, that explains why there. are Chinese people who's, who, who are not afraid of a war. Um, I, I know where that came from now. Um, okay, so let me see. From Michael Hanault. Hanault, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Maybe it's French. Don't pronounce the H. <laughs> Lei, Mao must have been hyper uh, rhetoric. He might have been on the prime objective of the American military. We've gone past the Hitler program as Putin now knows about his fate. Mm. So are you saying that Mao was just saying that? to achieve some other ulterior goals? I tend to believe, I, when I read that, I tend to believe it's generally what he thought. Um, I, I don't think he, I, I, I really think that he was, that's really what Mao truly believed in at the time when he said that. Some would keep on gaming. You can't have nuclear war now because of all the nuclear power stations that would go into meltdown and spew radiation into atmosphere. That's true. I mean, the, the, yeah, there's a big difference between the nuclear war now and the nuclear war then. Uh, but the mindset, the mindset in the CCP's leaders, you know, they're not afraid to sacrifice. Uh, the point I want to make is they're not afraid to sacrifice a big portion of their population in order to achieve their goal. That mindset has not changed. When will be part two? This Thursday. This Thursday. Uh, somebody say, Risi is amazing. How do you think China will start the war? I'll discuss that on Thursday. I think, uh, I think it will be an uncontrollable event. I, the way I, I, you know, just like the Sino-U.S. relations, I don't think either Xi Jinping or Joe Biden uh, has a good handle on the way the the downward trajectory of, of Sino-U.S. relations. Even though neither one wanted to deteriorate further or 
but they can't stop it anymore. Once a conflict reaches a certain momentum, you can't. You can only delay it or slow it down, but you can't change the direction. So I think things will get out of control,、um, and 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 something will happen. That's very unfortunate.、Uh, and this is precisely the message that、uh, Lloyd Austin was saying. You know, he said, "What did he say?" He said, "It could it could be very da- extremely dangerous, and it could get out of control." And John Kirby said, "It can get somebody can 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 be hurt. People can be hurt." I think the Americans have already seen that. You know, the the uncontrollability of of some of the dangerous things that the CCP. Is trying that will start the war, and not anyone intentionally will say, "Oh, okay,、uh, I'm going to start World War Three now.、Uh, I'm going to hit a button and <laughs> and drop an atomic bomb." No, that will not happen. But things, you know, one thing will lead to another, and this uncontrollability is what worries me. But so there's two uncontrollability. One is the uncontrollability. Uh, between the U.S.-China tension, right tensions, like what I discussed today,、um, that's there's an aspect of uncontrollability there, and then there's uncontrollability、um, in the in on the part of Xi Jinping, right? He he, how is he gonna let? How is he gonna make the decision, or what's his decision making is like? You know, I think it's very interesting to go through the rationales for those who argue that he won't start a war, and then also for those who say he will start a war.、Um, I think it's important for us to understand the rationale, and then we. My conclusion is, you know, the the uncontrollable, the uncontrollable nature of the affairs worries me. Um, so we'll we'll talk about that on Thursday. From Jeff Ramos, thank you for the donation.、Um, it's true that their warships take forty eight hours to sail their sea. Yeah, I I read it on a uh, uh, on a by a, something written by a, a very famous Chinese military blogger,、uh, somebody who's not based in China. Uh, and he said that it does take forty-eight hours for the CCP to start their carrier, because、uh, they use this steam engine, right? Because you need to burn; they need to burn. I don't know how many tons of water. They need to turn water into steam, and then so it does take time. So yeah, that's that's what I read. From Vilgate Falls, <laughs> am I pronouncing your name right? Hi, Lei. What do you think geopolitics of India will lose ten years down the line? We'll look. Sorry, we'll look ten years down the line. Oh, that's a big question.、Um, I think India will definitely have more people. I mean, it's already having more people than China. India's GDP will be greater than that of China.、Uh, that's what I can think of now. Other than that, I. Can't really say a whole lot, <laughs> but it's a it's a good question. Thank you, thank you for the donation from Alan Mandel. Thank you for the timely, informative, and important analysis. Thank you. From Alex Shim, Jiang、uh, Zhe Lei, your your opinion on Xi Jinping is correct. Xi Jinping does not like making money. Well, thank you. Here we have a fellow Chinese who shared my view. Yeah. Yeah. Cherry S. Like, do any thoughts on Canada? Are we the back way into U.S.?、Uh, you mean for the for the illegal immigrants? What do you mean? Are we the back way in? Oh, are we the back way in to U.S.? Um. Yeah. I have a speaking of Canada. I don't know if this is your、uh, my answer to you. I have a, a relative who's visiting me now, and she's from Canada, and she she、um, went to the went to a local DMV, you know, 
uh, to help a family member with with driver license and stuff. And when when she came out, she told me she said, "I feel so sad for for you Americans." I said, "Why?" And she said, "You spend, you guys, you know, you are the most powerful country in the world. But look at where you spend your money. You spend money all over the world, but you can't even take care of your own infrastructure. You can't even take care of your own government agencies." And and, and she said, "Look how crappy your DMV looks." And and she said, "It's dirty. It's inefficient." You know, she said they have so many people working there, but the but the speed of the service is dreadful. And so she said, you know, she said this is not good. You know, America is not doing the right thing for itself. Um, then yeah, so I think it's it's very interesting. And then, so we started talking about it, comparing Canada to the U.S. And um, you know, I said, well, Canada Canada has, I said at least. United States is alert, is like, you know, has been trying to stop the, the CCP's infiltration into the U.S. You know, the, the American government arrested five, you know, pro-CCP Chinese community leaders in the U.S. I said, CCP's infiltration into Canada is like more serious, but your government is not doing much. Uh, you know, Justin Trudeau is not doing much to stop CCP's infiltration into Canada. It's it's more uh, outrageous. So she said, "Yeah, it is true." But so I thought that was an interesting dialogue to uh, to share with you. Anyways, um, uh. Let me see. All right, from Sumiland, I just um, what does she think about the dam being destroyed in Ukraine? China regarding China U.S. relations, USA will stand our ground. PLA Navy and uh, uh, shoving, trip, tripping, and she threatens. I don't know what he will think. I think maybe the three gorges will come to his mind because if that dam breaks, so many lives will be lost. It will cause so many Chinese cities will be flooded. I mean, China has built so many, you know, gigantic mega dams. And if they break, they could cause tremendous, you know, they're just disastrous. Um, beyond description. So I'm sure those the, the security of the Chinese dams, you know, came to his mind. Um, but also, I wonder how many people really made him aware of what's happening. I was watching one one China expert talking about how Xi Jinping obtains information. And it's very interesting. And he said that he may not know really what's happening in Ukraine. Because those people, he does not read newspapers or watch videos like we do. You know, he reads these reports that other people prepare for him, and you don't know what those people put into these reports. And they may be, they may, they might, they may be crafted in a way that people want him to to believe. So I don't know if he is even aware of the the damn situation um, in Ukraine. Precisely because of the way he obtains, or, or the way a dictator obtains information, uh, people around him may be very careful about what information to give him, and that, and then, then he he you know that becomes very dangerous because he will be making decisions not based on true situ true info truthful information, but based on. Um, you know, partial information, partial truth, right? Um, all right, let me see. Okay, um, from Lei, don't you think fear is the key that she is trying to exploit in the minds of the rest of the world? Countries would want to avoid confrontation because of fear. Yes, that's that's the whole communist idea ideology 
right? The whole concept of revolution is fear, intimidation and fear. And so you will back off. And it's not just unique to Xi Jinping. It's just how communism works. I mean, that's what it believes. It believes in class struggle. It believes in revolution. It believes in, you know, bloodshed. And it believes in conf conflict. I always say communists thrive in conflicts. Um, they don't like peaceful time. They thrive when there are conflicts. When, when the world is entirely peaceful, when there are no conflicts, no geopolitical conflicts, communist, a communist regime would not thrive. They will, they will come up with a conflict. Um, and I noticed this when I was comparing people from mainland China with people uh, from Chinese from other, like from Taiwan or other parts of the world where Chinese is spoken, but they don't have, um, they're not under the influence of the communist ideology. And you see a big difference. People from mainland China, like they're very argumentative. They like to argue. They, they like to, they don't like, to hear different opinions. They, they like to, yeah, they like to fight and argue. Um, and also I observed that some of them get a bit, very excited when there are a conflict. Then they will step out trying to resolve the conflict. And so that they look like they're important and they're needed. And notice their leaders like that. There are people who who succeed when there are conflicts. But the best, the most benign, the, the most successful leaders are the ones who don't need to lead. You know, the, the, everything is, is well, everything is harmonious. People are not fighting and everyone is happy. Then, you know, you don't need to do anything. Those are the, the most successful leaders. But in today's world, there, are, there is a class of leaders who want there to be conflicts, who thrive when there are conflicts, because then they could exercise their power and exercise their leadership so that they appear important, so that they appear they can achieve something. And this, is this trait, this personality, or this characteristic is particularly obvious among the mainland Chinese, among amongst CCP leaders. And also, like in, in the West, they're also common amongst the, the more progressive leaders. Um, so I noticed that. And sorry, I forgot what the question was, but, oh, fear, yes. All right, so I've talked a lot. And thank you very much for joining me. And so stay tuned. So join me again on Thursday. We'll continue this discussion. And that one should be very interesting. All righty. Good night now. Or have, have a good day. All right. Okay. Bye-bye.